Now that we know the probability rules, let's look at some discrete probability practice questions. So obviously we're going to talk about probability, then we have to talk about the lottery because that is, you know, something that clearly relates to probability. So let's say this particular lottery, I can win if I match five digits in order to five randomly drawn digits. So remember, whenever they talk about digits, they're talking about zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero through nine, and there are 10 digits, the digits zero through nine. So if I'm looking for the probability of winning the jackpot, there's only one winning combination, just one. And so my probability of winning is one out of, and then my question is, how many different ways can this happen? Well, I have 10 digits five times. So it's 10 digits for the first draw, 10 for the second, 10 for the third, 10 for the fourth, 10 for the fifth, or just 10 to the fifth, obviously, is the easiest way to write that. So it's one over 10 to the fifth, which turns into one over 100,000, or as a probability as a decimal, 0 0.00001. So one in 100,000 that I will win. And this is actually a pretty nice lottery because a lot of them are worse. And this makes it even nicer. Let's say they're going to give me my money back if I match at least one digit which means I could match one, I could match two, I could match three, I could match four, or I could be the big winner and match all five. But my question is, what's the probability that I don't lose my money? Which means the best idea here is instead of finding the probability um, of matching one and two and three and four and five, and then adding all of those together would be the probability of at least one would be one minus the probability of not matching any. So this is where this little rule is gonna come into play because it's gonna be so much easier. So I'm going to take one minus, and then I have to look at, well, what's the probability that I don't match? So again, I can look at this as there are 100,000 different ways but what's the probability that I don't get the correct answer? Well, the first time it's nine out of 10, the second time it's nine out of 10, the third time it's nine out of 10, et cetera. You see where I'm going with this. So really it's just nine tenths to the fifth power or 0.9 to the fifth. And that ends up giving me one minus 0.59049 which turns into 0 0.40951. So there's about a 41% chance that I don't lose my money, which means you'd know that I totally made up this question because no lottery would do that. I want to take a look at a couple of cards questions now, and I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to think about it. First question has to do with probability of selecting a hand up, um, using a deck of cards of an ace, king, queen, jack, 10. Now, I'm assuming that we've all at least picked up a deck of cards before, but if you haven't, there are 52 cards in a deck. There are four of each type of card, so four aces, four kings, etc., cetera, um, because there are four suits, and there are 13 cards in each suit. And so hopefully we know all of that. You won't need that last little tidbit for this question. Um, or any of the questions I ask you on this slide. But again, it's good to know if you're doing any questions with um, decks of cards. So let's talk about two different ways to find this probability. Looking at a card, a deck of cards of ace, king, queen, jack, 10. One way to think about it is that there are four cards in the deck that are aces out of 52 cards. And then I'm going to select a king, and there are four kings, but there are only 51 cards left because I already chose an ace. So this would be the conditional probability 
Assuming I've already chosen an ace, what's the probability that I get a king? Assuming I've already chosen an ace and a king, there are now 50 cards left and four of them are queens, etc., etc. So I can continue this. And this seems like a good strategy, and it is, but the problem with this strategy is that this assumes that the order matters. And I know in a hand of cards that the order that I get the card doesn't matter. And so I also have to take this by how many different ways, how many different combinations are there, and there are five factorial, right? Because there's five different ways I could get this one first, this one second, etc. So there's five different ways that could happen. Now, this one gets a little bit confusing because then I have to remember to take it times five factorial. And instead of doing it this way, let's talk about it in terms of um, combinations. So the numerator, I'm going to actually write it over here. The numerator is that there are four aces and I'm choosing one of them. So four choose one. So I'm using my binomial coefficients. Notice over here I was using fractions. Here I'm using binomial coefficients. So how many kings are there? There are four. I'm going to choose one. How many queens? There are four. I will choose one. How many jacks? There are four. I will choose one. How many tens? There are four. I will choose one. My denominator, so here notice I'm not using a fraction. My denominator is that there are 52 cards and I am choosing um, five of them. 52 choose five. So how is this way better? Well, because then I don't have to remember this part because when I'm looking at combinations, they're already assuming that order doesn't matter. And so this is actually a really easy way to do this because I can just use that button in my calculator that looks like this and plug in four choose one. And of course, four choose one is just four. And then times four times four times four times four is what the numerator turns into, which notice that's exactly what I had here. My denominator is actually um, 52 factorial over five factorial, 47 factorial. And so notice what ends up happening is that I get, I'm just going to put four to the fifth on top. On the numerator, or sorry, the denominator, I end up with the 47 factorial canceling out. I get 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 divided by five factorial and we all know that we can then multiply by the reciprocal. And notice I get exactly what I got here when I did it by hand, but this way makes it to me make a lot more sense. And either way that I do that, I end up with a numerator of four to the fifth, which is 1024, a denominator of two, five, nine, eight, nine, six, zero, which was my 52 choose five. And that is approximately 0 0.000394. So that is my probability. Again, easiest way to go about it is to use the combinations. And again, if you're looking at questions in your textbook, instead of four choose one, they're going to write that as C four comma one, but just know that that's the same thing. And I would prefer you to write it using the binomial coefficients um, moving forward. So next question, what's the probability of selecting an ace four times in a row if cards are put back in the deck after each draw? Well, this one's pretty easy because if they're put back in the deck, I have 52 cards each time and I have four aces each time. So it's just four over 52 to the fourth. So four times in a row, which means four out of 52, four out of 52, etc. which is of course the same as one out of 13 to the fourth. And then I can just use my calculator to calculate one over 13 to the fourth power, which is approximately 0 0.000035. 
Last one, what is the probability the hand contains a full house? So if again, if you're not a card player, a full house means you have three of one um, type of card, so three aces, say, and two of another. So basically I have a set of three and a set of two. So what is the probability of getting that? So let's look at, so again, the denominator here is going to still be my 52 choose five because I'm still dealing with a deck of 52 cards and I'm choosing five of them. My numerator is gonna get a little bit more complicated. So we might be tempted to say, well, there's four choose three and four choose two because there are four of each kind and I'm choosing three and I'm choosing two. And that's correct, but I also have to take into account that the order matters in the numbers that I choose because if I get two queens and three aces, that's different than three queens and two aces. And so this one, I actually have to use a permutation. There are 13 different values going from two all the way up to ace, and I'm choosing two of them. So that is a permutation of 13 choose two. And so again, when I start multiplying this out to find my solutions, I'm going to end up with 13 times 12, which is the permutation of 13 comma two. And then four choose three ends up being four, and four choose two ends up being six, and I'm dividing all of that by two, five, nine, eight, nine, six, zero that I already computed, and what I end up with is 3,744 out of 2,598,960, or approximately 0 0.0014. So let's take a look at a bit question. Um, a sequence of 10 bits is randomly generated. What is the probability at least one of these bits is zero? So you know I love those at least questions. At least one is zero means that it could be that one of the bits is zero, two of the bits are zero, three of the bits are zero, four are zero, five, blah, 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 all the way up to 10. And if I had to find the number of ways that could happen and the number of different combinations within those, that's going to be a very lengthy problem. Instead, to find the probability of at least one zero, that's going to be the same as one minus the probability that there are no zeros. So again, how does that help me? Because there's only one way that I get no zeros, and that is if all 10 of the bits are one, so just one way, which means it's one minus one out of, and then how many different possibilities are there? Well, if I'm dealing with bits, that's a zero or a one, so that's two different options each time, and there are 10 bits, so that's two to the 10th. So it's one minus one over two to the 10th, because only one of them is going to look like this. So that gives me one minus one over 1024, which is of course 1023 out of 1024. Last one, what is the probability that a positive integer not exceeding 100 is divisible by either two or five? So this is an or question. And in an or question, Remember, I'm using probability of A union B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of their intersection. And so this one, the intersection is going to come into play because there are numbers that are divisible by both two and five, like 10. So let's take a look at the best way to solve this. I'm looking at the probability of two or five. So if I want to find the probability 
of 2, so let me go ahead and write this out, 2 and probability 5 minus that it's divisible by 2 and 5. The probability that a number is divisible by 2 is that I have 100 values and I am dividing it by 2. And that turns into, and this is going to be a floor function, not that it matters in this case because we're not going to get a decimal, but that's how I would do it as a floor function. Um, 100 divided by 2 is 50. Now remember that's 50 out of the 100 because we're dealing with probability, not number. The probability that something is divisible by 5 would be 100 divided by 5, again, floor function, which would be 20 values out of 100. Then I'm going to subtract the numbers that would be both divisible by 2 and 5, which means they have to be divisible by 10, right? So I'm going to take 100 divided by 10 floor function, which is 10 values, so that would be the numbers 10 and 20 and 30 all the way up to 100 that I counted here, but also counted here. So I have to subtract the ones I counted twice, otherwise obviously it doesn't work out because I've counted them twice. So this gives me 50 plus 20, which is 70, minus 10, so that's 60 out of 100, or 0.6 would be the probability. Let's make a deal. How many of you have watched this show before? I know it's Wayne Brady now, but back in the day, the host used to be Monty Hall, which is why they call this the Monty Hall puzzle. This puzzle says that you've got three doors, and behind one of these doors is a fabulous prize that you want to take home. If you choose the correct door, you get to keep the prize. But once you choose a door, let's say I'm choosing door number one. Once I choose a door, the host will then open one of the other doors that's not a winner. So say they open up, he opens up number three, and three is not a winner. So the question is, should I stick with door number one, or is it better, based on probability theory, to switch to door number two? So think about that for a minute, and then we'll go over it together. So what did you choose? Well, you should choose to switch to door number two, and here's why. When I chose the first time, my probability of winning was just one out of three, which, you know, that's just typical. There's three doors, one of them wins out of three. But now, if I switch, then my probability of winning is actually going to be two-thirds because if I win, that means my initial pick was wrong. And if my initial pick was wrong, that's one minus one-third or two-thirds. So basically, it's always a better deal to change, again, based on probability theory. So that's not saying for sure that door number two is the winner, but based on probability theory, Essentially, I'm giving you another one-third probability that you are going to be the winner. Again, we found that by saying that my probability of winning the first time was one-third. And so the second time, I'm looking at I win if my initial pick was wrong. And remember, my initial pick was one-third, and so if my initial pick was wrong, then one minus one third gives me two thirds. That's my probability of winning now because they've already taken this guy out of the equation for me.